Welcome, Rachel Chambers, my, my friend, my old friend. Um, and just for introductions, um, for folks that don't know me, my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship and also a professor at the Weatherhead School of Management. Uh, I mean, it is a great pleasure to welcome uh, my good friend from uh, Wharton MBA program, Rachel yeah. Ben Fink, now Chambers. Um, who's going to share um, her experiences in, in working in a lot of our leading large and small companies in, in the marketing and, and uh, building brands and products field. Um, we're thrilled, as, as we always do um, with these sessions, to have student moderators and Vishwa Aduru. Am I pronouncing your last name? How do you pronounce your surname? Yeah, that's right. Aduru. I had uh, Vishwa's brother, Shai, as a student. They're... Um, Great, great family um, from Austin, Texas, all the way up here in chilly Cleveland and um, proud members of the Case West Reserve men's tennis team. And Earl is, is here as well from the tennis team. Um, so these sessions are best when people ask questions. Um, so for those that are here on Zoom or if you're on LinkedIn Live, if you're on Zoom, just let Vishu and I know if you have a question and we'll work you in. And if you're on LinkedIn Live, just put a question in the comments and I will be monitoring it and I'll feed it to Vishwa. So with that, over to you, Vishwa and Rachel, thanks for joining. Sure, absolutely. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Vishwa Adu. I'm currently a freshman at Case. Um, I'm currently un undecided on my major. I'm looking into finance, computer science, um, something in those fields. Um, but yeah, so I'm really excited to be moderating this session today. Um, and so just to start off, uh, I was wondering if Rachel, if you could just talk a little bit about yourself maybe and um, yeah. your career field path for now. Yeah, 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 uh, absolutely. So yeah, so I have, um, let's see, went out of undergrad, wanted to work, thought I wanted to be an investment banker and uh, ha had the opportunity to work in commercial real estate, um, an investment company, it's now Jones Lang LaSalle's the company now and uh, in their analyst program. And it was interesting, like it, it all links together there, but one of the reasons I was interested in commercial real estate because there was a physical asset linked to it, you know, so versus these amorphous products and everything, there was something physical, tangible you were working with. Um, awesome experience, uh, great group of people, fun to live in Chicago. Um, but as you know, progressed in the analyst thing, realizing as you progress in the company, it becomes more about working the transaction and working the deal. And that wasn't as interesting to me. And it was more this uh, spark of general management, you know, owning the product, being more interested. That's where some of the marketing elements, that idea of uh, brand was kind of sparked. Um, before I went to grad school, I had the opportunity to teach uh, English for a year in the Czech Republic. So, uh, and I was in a small town about two hours uh, south of Prague. And what was really interesting there was the mid nineties. So um, very fortunate to be there during this time of still tremendous transition after the um, fall of communism and the transition in government. And so really great um, case studies and watching all these new products come to market, apologies there, um, and how all these new things were happening. And so a lot more, um, uh, spark in that brand management as you see the um, all these new products come to market, American products, other things there. So really appealing. Went back to grad school and was pretty focused on brand management out of the get-go because of that interest. And then had the interest opportunity to work at P&G coming out, which is came back to my hometown area of Ohio. Uh, spent 12 years there working across brands um, and then just the benefits too of uh, working with other folks and building advocates too, which I encourage you all to, to, to have. Um, had the opportunity to, uh, an old boss of mine at uh, P&G became the head of Starbucks uh, CPG business. So wanting to bring all that business, so I had the opportunity to go out and be a part of building that capability uh, at Starbucks, an amazing experience. And then we needed to be, we moved to Seattle, but needed to be back in Cincinnati. So came back and joined a confection company, a candy company, which was family owned. Uh, Perfetti Van Mel is the name, which most of you probably don't know, but they're some of the brands they make, hopefully you know and love. Uh, Airheads Candy and Mentos Candy and Gum are two of the key US brands. 
And then um, just recently in the past six weeks, uh, I've joined uh, Voss Water. And again, another opportunity of an old boss uh, from Starbucks actually is the um, uh, new CEO of Voss Water and uh, building the new team. So he asked me to come on board to lead marketing. So great opportunity. And so just great uh, also experiences across big publicly traded, uh, privately held family owned and now very uh, learning the ways of private equity um, well, and uh, some of the multiple stakeholders, multiple owners, that model as well. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool how you talked about um, starting PNG, like really big company going and transitioning into like smaller company like mm-hmm. Boss. Um, what would you say are like some of like the biggest like advantages or disadvantages you've noticed like going from like a bigger company like PNG um, now from now working at Boss in your like six weeks here so far? Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of pros and cons, right? And any model, right? So a um, on the big publicly traded side, um, a pro, you know, a lot of resources, established processes, um, you know, there's typically vetted career development programs and training programs. So um, that is a, a big pro for sure, <clears throat> especially starting out if you're looking for more of those training grounds and other pieces, hugely uh, beneficial and learning a lot of great fundamentals and uh, ways of working that are um, I've found to be very valuable in my uh, as I've moved on to other companies. Um, and uh, some of the challenges in a big publicly traded right is a lot of times the size and your ability. Your you know I've always found that I truly believe you can make an impact wherever you are in an organization, but you typically own a smaller piece of the pie earlier on. Right there's tends to be my more hierarchical structures. And then you're often a, um, uh, there's the Wall Street pressure, right? The shareholder pressure. And so that drives sometimes a lot of decisions. And the family owned. um, So you you remove the whole, all the the shackles of uh, publicly traded, right? And all those pieces, but now you have an owner, right? Somebody who's, this is their baby. This is what they've done. And, you know, you um, are working for them. So that comes with its own, uh, you know, both awesome things, right? They offer resources. You can have a longer term view, um, but they are, you know, they're, they're the owners, right? And so you serve at their pleasure. Um, I think another benefit too, because it was a smaller, you know, organization is you do get to have your arms around uh, a bigger piece of the pie. And I've felt that, you know, really the ability to impact kind of end to end was very gratifying in that regard. Uh, despite some of the size. And now at Boss, I'm still, it's still very early days. Um, But this is literally though, we are pretty small, pretty scrappy. We have a huge growth ambition and growth trajectory, an amazing brand asset um, that uh, I believe we have. So it's all about rolling up your sleeves and making it happen, which is really fun. Um, I love getting dirty and doing doing the work as well as helping oversee. So, um, but yes, I hope that that helpful yeah definitely i think yeah. uh, that's pretty cool um the, the different dynamic between these pu- um, publicly traded companies versus these uh, smaller family-owned companies yeah um yeah so when um clearly you have um you've been in marketing the marketing field for a while now um have you noticed any big um trends or changes from when you started um a while ago to now um anything big you've noticed in particular yeah, absolutely. I think um, the biggest shift by far has been the where the power dynamic lies. So, and I kind of came in on the tail end of this, but it used to be the manufacturer uh, and CPG in particular, right? Uh, had a lot of the power. They had the power to really influence retailers to carry their items. Really, a lot of power in the marketing, right? Um, and from in driving consumer choice. Um, and that's really shifted. So first I watched the shift from manufacturer to retailer as retailers built scale um, and through acquisition and growth. So it went from all the different um, uh, mom and pop grocery stores and you didn't have a lot of the chains as that consolidated, you saw retailers really begin to be bigger than a lot of the companies, manufacturers and really wield their power. And so how you know some of that power dynamic shift there 
And then the latest shift has been in the past, you know, 10, 15, well, it's been more than that, but really in the past 10, 15 years, the shift now, the power base to the consumer, right? So the consumers now have so much more um, ability to drive the conversation, drive the engagement, drive where they go, drive their choice. Um, so it's really been that power shift has been probably the most dynamic. And then that's, so that's really changed a lot of the ways we go to market, um, how we think about uh, levels of partnership, how we work with consumers and, and with some of these shifts as well. I think the other piece, that, an outcome of that is just the um, fragmentation of media. Um, as you've gone from one manufacturer putting things on, uh, you know, a couple TV channels and some print ads to now all the just uh, different ways we need to engage and stay in touch with the consumer through traditional advertising, content creation, influencers, social media, all those things that added fragmentation and complexity uh, has been fun, but also uh, hugely challenging as well, just to stay on top of things as we make our choices. Um, yeah, and it definitely makes sense. Um, so it looks like um, Earl has a question. Um, yeah. So if, Earl, if you could just um, introduce yourself, unmute yourself, and then ask your question. Uh, hi, Rachel. Thanks for doing this today. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, I'm a senior at Case. I'm, I'm getting a bachelor's in economics and I'm pursuing a master's in finance, and I am a uh, team member of Vishwa. And nice. um, um, I guess my question goes back to, uh, you, you talked about a lot of big brands. You work with a lot of big brands like Starbucks. Yeah. You've worked with Airheads. And so I was wondering if, if, if I'm a startup and I want to establish a brand, have you noticed anything about these companies that have like made them stand out and like how they developed the brand, how they kind of marketed the brand to kind of make them successful and some things that you can um, impart onto someone trying to build a brand? Sure. Um, yeah. So I think always, you know, if you're starting a brand, right, is really what's your purpose? What's your mission? What's your difference, right? What problem are you helping solve for consumers? And is that, you know, seen as meaningful? And if you can, that business idea, that brand really has that connection and can get, build that build that traction. I think that is always, I think, where, where the magic happens, whether it's a big brand or a small brand. And I think that's where small brands have really caught um, a lot of bigger brands on their back heels, um, as we've seen, um, because they've been able through, the big brands might not have seen the value, right, or the scale in some of these ideas. They might have missed it in things or been a little arrogant at times as well. So I think that ability to really find that space, find that unmet need, find that proposition that's really holding true to someone and build that traction, I think is ultimately always the, the key to success. I think then how to go to market, right? To build that success, right? As you're, you don't have the, a lot of the resources. So I think, which is one of the great benefits of so many of the channels now being able to go to direct to consumer, um, use Amazon as a platform and other D to C um, that then venues, right? That help you build that one-to-one -one connection in particular and learn as you go. Um, to get that direct interaction with the consumer as well. And once you build that success, right, others start to notice. And then that helps you get some of that other. And I don't know if you're looking at a, you know, my, my experience is with packaged goods. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not uh, tech marketing, tech brand work makes me nervous. I get a little overwhelmed <laughs> by all the complexity, but I still think a lot of those core elements stay true. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that response. Um, it looks like Aaron um, has a question. Um, once again, if you can just unmute yourself and, and then introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, Rachel. Um, Hi, Aaron. My name is Aaron, and I'm actually an employee at Case in the um, School of Medicine Department of Development and Alumni Relations. And oh, I just nice. a topic to be interesting. Um, also, when I saw the word Voss, it came right to my mind of when I'm in front of the coolers at the gas station. <laughs> and okay, I, good. Because you know we have distribution. Exactly. So University yeah. Hospital. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Is University Hospital a part of Case? Is that the? We still yes. Yeah, so we still yeah. have an affiliation with both. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. My uh, cousin was a uh, radiologist at University. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. So my question is in regard actually to philanthropy. Over the last few yeah. years, we have seen so many companies really step out and 
build a, a philanthropic component to their yeah. organization and really advertised, you know, not just the product, but, you know, here's what we're going to do for the community. Yeah. And I'm wondering, as we think going forward, and a lot of those are large companies right now, what kind of opportunities job-wise do you see maybe within companies, even if they're a smaller or mid-sized company, you know, real life job titles, not necessarily foundation piece where they're going to give a bunch of money away, but that type of work, um, you know, do you see that growing? Do you see that, you know, actually being real job piece? I mean, where does that live within a company? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think it's, um, yeah, what's, what's the role of, so I think it starts with the brand's purpose, right? If they've been able to clearly articulate what their purpose is and identify their stakeholders, right, that they believe are really key and what role is community and giving play in that, right? So um, I think consumers are continuing to become a more and more savvy and demanding that of their brands. Um, and But I think it's where in their life stage, how they want to execute that, right? Does that become just through uh, giving? Does that become a job title in and of itself or linked to, to other things? So for example, I think where we are right now, you know, I, um, uh, we do a lot of corporate giving in terms of giving. So we, the brand's been through a lot of different ownership things uh, the past several years. So there's been some ups and downs. Uh, and, and uh, consistency, um, but still giving and sharing water is such a core vital part of people's lives. So like, for example, in this past year, we donated over a million bottles of water um, to organizations. Now that wasn't a job, you know, someone's dedicated job, right? So there was a, a gentleman on my team uh, that leads a lot of our social and influencer helps sync up. And we worked with um, Dwayne Johnson as one of our, The Rock is one of our, um, uh, spokes or partners and with him and other influencers, right? To how can we help facilitate that? We have our whole supply chain um, piece that has all the uh, parts. So it's been a part of people's jobs mm -hmm. uh, it, where I've been today versus a um, dedicated role. And again, we're, we're pretty small. Um, I think at other companies like Starbucks, right? Where there is so much more about, you know, the initiatives around veterans, uh, around, um, you know, partner engagement, around education, right? There's other places where there are um, mm -hmm. very robust roles and dead things dedicated to that. So I, I don't really know if how many of those roles really exist, but I'd say there's room mm -hmm. for them. Um, but I think flexibility and interest in um, uh, being able to wear multiple hats is probably you know, uh, savvy too. I think we're seeing it a lot with diversity and inclusion too, mm -hmm. right? How to think about those roles as just absolute dedicated roles because sometimes they really need to be versus mm -hmm. do they become something that, you know, becomes a part of someone's role, if that makes sense. Right. I don't know, did I answer your question? No, it does. And it also made me think sort of from a selfish perspective, yeah. what I do, <clears throat> you know, there's, I think there's an opportunity here to make, not make, but encourage, you know, somehow influence or encourage those who are buying your product are not just paying for your product, but if they know your product is giving X amount to absolutely, yeah, that group, not only have they been a customer at that moment, but they've been a little bit of a philanthropist too, which I think absolutely, yeah, is a long way for sort of helping our, our world stay in that, um, stay in that mindset of philanthropy that you can do, a, you know, even just a smidge. Absolutely. Yeah. I think some brands have made it really core to their identity, right? Like the Tom's yeah. shoes of the world. And I know they're changing their model right now and others and, um, and others have figured it out as they've gone along. Um, but I think always starting with what's your purpose as a brand, you know, why are we existing? Why are we getting there? And who, who are the stake, you know, who are those people that we want to, to work with and involve? And I think consumers definitely appreciate, I think the model of corporations purely just for profit is, you know, shifting, I think, in a good way. Um, and how do we just keep and, and, and do that and execute that within on a company by company level? But I agree, consumers are demanding it a lot more now uh, right. than they have in the past. Right. Thank you so much. Thanks sure, for your time. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. The quick question, uh, great response. I think uh, definitely hope to see more um, corporate philanthropy in the future. Um, I think Professor Goldberg um, has a question now. Yeah, about airheads. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a tough one, Rachel. You yeah. weren't gonna get out of here without a 
grilling for me. Um, so, you know, when, when we were in business school together, I think we barely had cell phones, let alone smartphones. Yeah. Um, but now, whether it's us or our kids and sort of seeing how folks are using um, their phones and social media to communicate, um, you know, particularly, I mean, my kids are high school kids. So short videos, you know, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok, I mean, it really is jarring and quite amazing to sort of see um, what folks are doing with short video. And it's something actually we're wrestling with even on our campus, whether it's we're working with startups, you know, kind of like what Earl was asking about. I'm sort of curious from either kind of your current world at Boss and obviously you You've worn a bunch of different hats in small, large companies, you know, embracing social media and, and using short videos um, to, to get at folks that maybe have much shorter attention spans than like yeah. a second commercial or aren't reading traditional newspapers. I'm sort of curious as how, how has your world changed and morphed as these new platforms? Oh, yeah, I'll be honest, like I can't keep up with it. <laughs> So like, and the long running joke in my old job was on my Snapchat account, right? I, I had one follower and it was an ABM on my, my team because I couldn't figure it out. So, um, yeah, so to me, it is like, it's exciting, but it's also overwhelming, right? As you just think, oh, like how many things do I need to do and stay on top of? And like, I can't keep it straight and they change daily, right? Oh, Facebook, I used to be able to target this way and now I can, I got to target this way. So having our, our investments in media experts and um, has, you know, increased, right? Is I need to have, you know, and we've invested in my uh, last role at um, Perfetti. Um, you know, we had a dedicated full-time person, you know, for, for media and one and one and a half, because it just is so complex to help partner with our agencies to help keep us all, all, uh, all straight. But, um, in terms of what you need to do and where to be present, I think it really starts with who's your target consumer, right? Like really, really understanding them. What, what are they using to, to get messages, um, how to reach them, et cetera. So if you're going after old ladies like me, it's a little, it's much different than if I'm trying to attract um, a teenager. Um, so really, and then what are your objectives, right? As a brand, is it really about building that awareness? So I, um, and what, in what category are you in? So in confection, right? Like the most important thing I need to do is be aware, right? And can like airheads, for example, there's no brand loyalty, you know, people have eight or nine brands in their consideration set at any one time. There's no risk to the purchase, right? It's a dollar, you know, like it's not a, there's no consideration and there's so much on impulse. So what I needed to be, I needed to be in their head and feel like uh, relevant for them, right? So this is a brand I'm aware of and it's, it's a brand I think is for me. So when they're walking in a store that hopefully our sales guys have gotten that distribution, right? that they see the brand, boom, I want to, I want to buy that brand versus in, um, uh, you know, cars or other higher consideration, higher, well, coffee, even for example, like Starbucks, right, is an expensive coffee, um, an older target consumer, much more driven by an occasion. Um, so how I want to reach them will be different, right, as I think about how I want to make sure this, this item's worth it how I can link it and make occasion special, how I can pair it with things. So it was a different model of message and barriers you need to overcome. And I think so if you understand your consumer and what job you know barriers you're trying to overcome to reach them, I think then that helps really build some clarity on what are those tactics and tools um, that you need to reach them. Um, but agree, it is overwhelming when you, um, when you get to it. I think if everybody's on the same page of who you're trying to go after and what you're trying to accomplish with them, those are, that's the harder work I feel like. And then once you get that clear, then the tactics usually help um, take care of themselves a little bit. Great, thanks. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, Earl has um, another question. Go for it, Earl. Um, yeah, so you were talking about getting in the consumer's head. And so I was yeah. wondering how 
how do you guys, I know, I know data is like a big, a big thing now is a big yeah. trend. And so is that the main way you guys kind of like the data analytics to get into, to understand a consumer or are there other Oh yeah, um, data's great. techniques? Yeah. yeah. Uh, data is great having the quantitative data, but there's nothing better than spending time with a consumer, right? And consumers and, um, and getting to know them, building that richness in the conversation, whether it's a, um, uh, you know, is, you know, a shop along, you know, in-home interviews, you know, even focus groups, right? When you can put context and richness and emotion around the sales, sorry, I'm at my mom's house and she has a landline. Don't tell anybody. Um, so the, <laughs> uh, the, that richness and understanding of the consumer is just, it, it does so much to help enhance right, and bring richness to um, your understanding of them um, than, uh, uh, thanks, Michael, the, um, than just looking at numbers on a page. So um, any opportunity you can to interact with the consumer live or uh, build that, I think always just pays off, especially when you're um, you know, creating an idea or, or something new. Again, you need the quantitative data to help validate things at time or, you know, help build some of that quantification, but whenever you can get those interactions and there's so a nice thing with mobile, it's enabled um, lots of other ways to get those engagement, right? Cause everybody's got a camera now, right? Uh, you don't have to establish these fancy focus groups where you're having everybody come in to sit around a, a conference table. Thank you. Yeah. And I've been known to spy on people in the grocery store too and ask them uh, Ask some questions on the fly. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering. Um, so we talked about like the target consumer, um, and so when we when you try to like um, implement like a new marketing strategy, yeah. and it might not be successful, um, what kind of like options are, do you look at? Um, and try to like change that, and also, and at what point do you try to think about maybe changing your target audience or things like that? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think they're, um, you know, not everything's always successful, right? So I think it's always making sure you spend the time and digging through and doing a good postmortem of why, what, 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 what went sideways? Um, because every plan never is executed well, as well uh, as planned. And a lot of times I think I find when things haven't gone as planned, um, well, there's actually, there's no big rule of thumb, but a lot of times there's, you know, but spending, making sure you spend that time and go back and look at it. So um, was a lot, I guess I would say a lot of times, the big idea was it executed as you intended, right? So a lot of times we have grand strategies and grand ideas, but when it comes to the actual execution of it, um, it didn't, doesn't get executed. And the consumer doesn't really care about your big strategy or your big, big idea. If they don't see it and can't experience it, that's great. And I, and I know I've been... Uh, I've had to learn, relearn a few times in, in my career, like you work in marketing, right? You want to work on the big campaigns, the big ideas, but if you don't have distribution, if you don't have the right pricing strategy, if you're not in the right places where people are looking for your product, like, you know what, for, forget it, right? Because you can do all this amazing uh, marketing, but if people can't find it, it's not the right price. It's, it's not in the right section of the store, forget it. So um but I think it's always doing that post looking about, you know, what did I intend to do? How did it execute? Uh, what did I need? What, what do I need to do? Understanding the category dynamics, right? Are we seeing new entrants coming in? Are we seeing shifts in how uh, people are, are uh, experiencing the category, new occasions that are emerging? I think you just really need to stay in touch with, um, with the data and the trends as well. Um, but I think, you know, I think to your initial piece of things go sideways, right? I think it's always making sure you do that, spend that appropriate time and do an honest postmortem, uh, which sometimes can be challenging because folks like, let's just move on. Let's just move on, right? I don't want to rehash the past. Let's just move on. There can be um, uh, defensiveness, right? Like, you know, people don't want to be in the blame game. Let's build, not blame, you know, uh, uh, don't want to feel like they're being picked on. But I think whenever you can get the folks around the table uh, to really do that deconstruction, always with the mindset of how do we do better, um, always pays out. But it's not always easy to do. Right. Yeah. I think 
especially finding like pinpointing the specific problem um, is definitely it seems like a tough spot um so i was wondering you talked about um there's like a new transition uh, recently into like consumer powered marketing and things like that is um currently um, i was wondering um if you think that would change at all for the future or like what do you expect to happen in the future yeah no um yeah consumers will continue to be in control uh i i don't see that changing and i think well how will we continue to adjust uh to that um and how will the our ways of shopping uh continue to adjust i think it's been this past year has been really um interesting i mean hard in lots of ways but uh really interesting too because it's fast forwarded a lot of trends accelerated some crazy trends and um what will be the lasting impact that that has on um on our how we shop how we use products how we interact with products as well um i think we'll see you know from the old categories that i've worked in even the, the one now right so COVID has accelerated um uh, lots of e-commerce activities right um our ways of shopping for groceries i think are forever changed so um uh, our habits of being at home more right so uh the gum and mint category our mentos business you know that category was decimated it's been decimated in the past year you know people are it's down 25 percent because people aren't number one, interacting with other people. So nobody really cares how, what their breath is. People aren't going through the checkout lanes in the grocery store, right? Where most, the majority of those categories are being purchased, you know, more focus on health and wellness. So I think, um, you know, the impacts of COVID too will have a lasting and enduring impact um, on, um, you know, both how we shop, and then the consumer, you know, I think we'll accelerate some of the consumer power as well. Yeah, That's thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think Professor Goldberg has kind of a similar question relating to the pandemic. Yeah, yeah just to follow up. Um, yeah. You, you made a career switch, um, or at least a company switch, maybe not. Company but, switch, yeah. You know, mid, mid pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm sort of curious. I mean, as a, as a company that's selling um, water from across the Atlantic and whose headquarters aren't even in your where you're living, if you can even talk about um, distributed work, both kind of, you know, joining a company kind of in the middle yeah. of the pandemic and sort of as you see going forward, you know, what does it mean? What does place mean in terms of... Yeah building your team working yeah. with no it's great yeah we're struggling with that question right now so it's been yeah it's been interesting this um well so i've been working from home a year now and um uh at first it was so hard right and even at our because the company was such a hands-on meeting cult culture and it was exhausting in lots of ways but also you know freeing in lots of ways and i think the only reason i'm working now for boss water is really because of the pandemic, to be totally honest, right? So um, the company was, their headquarters were in New York City. Um, they, everybody came and sat there, the plants in, in Norway. Um, and uh, they shut it down, they shut the office down. Um, no reason to pay you know, uh, for space at Rockefeller Center when nobody's there. Um, the new CEO, Glenn, is uh, he lives in Naples nine months of the year and the shore, the other three months, Jersey Shore, three months of the year. Uh, so the the COVID has unlocked, you know, change, changed also ways of working, right, forever um, that I think will be interesting to watch. So our team now is, uh, so I'm in Cincinnati. Our head of supply chain is in, uh, he's, well, he was in Atlanta. We were just transitioning to a guy now that's in New Jersey. Uh, our CEO's in Florida. We've got still a lot of people in the New York City area. Uh, our head of sales is in Texas. So it's been really interesting um, to join a company now. And my, my team is all in New York, but it's uh, been really interesting to join a company. And I haven't met a single, I know I've met one person face-to-face, -face, but that was, you know, because I used to work for them, but it's all been virtual. Uh, we're hoping to be able to have our first live meeting together here soon in the next few months. So, um, but I don't think it would have never worked 
um, if, you know, uh, if the pandemic hadn't happened and, you know, folks just weren't totally rooted and grounded in uh, virtual learning. I think what will be challenging uh, and interesting to watch, right, is we don't have a plan yet. If we will go back to being in the office, but I know my old job, one of the reasons it was worked well because everybody's on the screen. And if you get back into a situation where you got half the room sitting around the table and half on a conference call, right, back from the old <laughs> dynamics of it being really hard to communicate, hard to hear, hard to participate, I think those will be the interesting uh, uh, things we got to work through going forward. But it has been really interesting joining the company and not meeting folks, but it, it, it hasn't been, of course, I'd rather work with people around the table, but it hasn't been as uh, hard as I expected it to be because I think everybody's doing it um, and been doing it now for a year. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, great. yeah. I mean, we're all, it's great to get your insight on this. Um, yeah. We're doing it on campus. We're, and the yeah. difficulty, and these guys know it. I mean, the difficulty, yeah. dual delivery and kind of where yeah. we're, we're going back to a, um, hopefully knock on wood, you know, having students back in the classroom. But I think there are yeah. a lot of things out of this period that we're going to carry with us. Yeah. Yeah. My sister's got it. She's a public school teacher in Chicago and she's trying to do the, uh, you know, where she's got half the kids on the computer and half in the classroom. And that, that to me has got to be the ultimate challenge uh, of how you and making sure you're addressing both groups. So, yeah. Sure. All right, Vishal, maybe one more question just for time. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I just had a, just one last question um, regarding like um, if for individuals um, in in college looking to get into marketing, mm -hmm. um, would you recommend like any like, what would, you, what would you say, like some, maybe some technical skills um, they should try to learn in order to like, be yeah. successful in the field? Yeah, um, good question. Yeah, because I was an arts and science major undergrad. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I think the, you know, just all being, you know, the level of curiosity, I think from, uh, but, you know, if you have opportunities to just understand the, um, understand the skills of, marketing right and how can you potentially seek those out in your classwork um, without necessarily you know going down hardcore technical skills so I think being a great writer being a great critical thinker being a great problem solver um, being able to think about big ideas from a strategy standpoint as well as executing ideas I think you can get I know you can get a lot of those just key skills and any type of you know um, major you uh, go into, and then if you can just supplement that with um, you know if there's something about consumer insights or even sociology, right, where you're getting and learning about how you learn about cultures and societies, um, and then potentially how to um, uh, if, if there's a specific area of you know even just a marketing 101, but then but just start reading the reading trade magazines, I think a lot of time, right? Advertising age or other pieces, I think you can learn and pick up a lot of the jargon, if not, and start to get some of those understandings um, that I think can give you some of the technical background you might need. But I'd say looking for internships too, there's nothing better than getting that feet on the street experience. That's gonna be much more valuable than something. I think a lot of times what you you know, might pick up in a technical class. Uh, so take advantage, my, I would always take advantage of your undergrad experience to just really get those foundational experiences and, and the skills and the basics. It'll, it'll take you there. That's good. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to hand it back to Professor Goldberg right now, but really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Vishwa. Yeah. Hey, Vishwa, thank you. Great job moderating. Look forward to hopefully getting you in class, like your brother, troublemaker yeah. that he was in my class. Is good, uh, good, good guys. I'm, I'm a big fan of the men's tennis team here. So I, I see them every morning practicing as I walk. Nice. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for doing this. It's You're awesome welcome. to catch up. Um, I do look forward to being, being fellow Ohioans at some point. Yes. I know we haven't seen each other in a long time, but that's um, good. Really appreciate you sharing insights with us today.